Okay, we are live. Hello, everybody. Uh, this is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Um, welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. And tonight, uh, I'm continuing my conversations with Brother Jason Jack. We've been doing a series called 101 Verses Proving Faith Alone. Now, I, tonight, I think we're on number 66 on our list of 101 verses. Uh, if you have not seen all the other videos, um, you can go to my YouTube channel, Sin City Preacher, and find those. I hope you'll watch it all from the beginning. Uh, but tonight is a special night because uh, this is the first night that Brother Jason is actually uh, uh, going to actually have video and audio both. Before, uh, I just recorded, did a recording with him on my cell phone on speaker so you, you could hear brother jason but you couldn't see him so uh brother matthias i uh, he helped me uh last week or so to work out the technical problems i had so now we're doing these live streaming brother just because this is live i don't want you to feel any pressure okay <laughs> you know like oh no i don't want to make I'll do mistake. my best <laughs> Okay, so um, brother, um, why don't you take just a second, introduce yourself. I know you just got back from a vacation, so I'm, I'm so glad that you returned. Uh, you were gone so long, I was actually starting to worry about you. <laughs> well, I went to a wedding. My flower girl got married in South Carolina a couple weeks ago and got back, had a whirlwind of a week, um, sort of a half week at work trying to fit everything in before going on a 20th anniversary uh, vacation with my wife and we did that and just got back um, late this weekend and right back at it catching up a lot at work a lot of surgery cases and and so i've just now tonight got where i could sort of catch my breath here so i'm glad to get back and uh return doing this and Looks like um, we're on verse 60, or yeah, I think verse 65 out of 101. So hopefully this will help on the last third of this study of 101 Bible verses where you can not only hear me, but see me, maybe better understand, um, you know, uh, what I'm saying through reading my lips and body language. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I know that... Uh... It is nice to have a face to go along with the, the, the words. Uh, and for those of you uh, viewing that um, are not familiar with uh, Brother Jason Jack, um, I have done quite a few videos with him. Uh, and I did a kind of like an introduction or an interview video with him. So I hope you'll watch that. And you'll, you'll learn a lot about him. Uh, but his, his YouTube channel, he's already done a lot of great videos. Uh, he's a, one of the one of the um, few uh, really strong uh, defenders of the faith. Uh, when I say defenders of the faith, I'm talking about the true gospel. Uh, and uh, so I hope you will go to his channel and um, subscribe to it and, and watch his videos. So today uh, we're starting off with, uh, let me see what. Uh, I think we're number 65, Titus 2.11. Yeah, I need to find where, okay, there it is. Okay, that um, in the KJV it says, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. All right, brother, you know how I always like to put you on the spot to uh, be the first to comment. So go ahead. Yeah, this is, you know, this is sort of a, a short verse and part of a full thought process that. Uh, Paul is relating to Titus. Uh, just looking at this and then reading on to finish the sentence. So I'll just read it. Verse 11 again, it says, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Um, and then goes on um, the famous verse in Titus 2.13, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ. And then verse 14, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. So as you know, I like to read a little bit, maybe 
uh, before and after to get the verse in context. Obviously, the grace of God is what brings salvation, and that's through the person of Jesus Christ. Um, that's who's appeared to all men. That's who is the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world, as it says in John 1, 9. And, you know, I'm kind of disappointed that we didn't get to this verse on the last video because when we finished talking about Titus 3, 7, which ended the last video, I got on a little bit of a rant talking about Lordship salvation and showing verses that discuss salvation, but then shows what we should be doing after salvation, going unto good works. And I cited Ephesians 2, 8 through 10 and Titus 3, verses 4 through 8, and then the end of 2 Timothy 3. This goes right hand in hand with that same concept. It shows us how to get saved, you know, by God's grace, through faith in Jesus Christ. That's who brings salvation. That's who's appeared to all men. But then that he redeems us from all iniquity and pur purifies us, you know, working from the inside out with that Holy Spirit of promise that he gives all believers. But then we should go on and two good works again, just like it says in verse 14, um, in verse 12, that we should live soberly, righteously and godly in this present world. It doesn't say we will, and that's a part of salvation and that our actions show that we're saved or not, but simply it gives us the verse that points to Jesus Christ, who is our salvation, who is eternal life. That's who we trust in. That's who we rest in to receive the free gift of salvation. But then once we receive that as a believer, then we should go on to live godly. We should go on to be zealous of good works. Um, this concept is over and over throughout the Bible. Um, so again, I like this because it clearly defines what leads to salvation and then clearly defines what's a part of discipleship. What Lordship Salvation does is it mixes the two and muddies the gospel and changes the gospel into a false gospel, into an accursed gospel. Um, so, you know, just to start this um, video um, of the 101 verses, um, you know, I just want people to be, um, you know, sound on the true gospel. That is not what we do. It's what he did. It's what Jesus Christ did, that he died for our sins, um, that he arose on the third day. He overcame death for us, and we simply rest in his finished work on the cross. Um, but then we should go on and mature as a disciple of Christ over time and should go on to lead a godly life and to, be, um, to do our reasonable service, to be pleasing to God, to share the gospel with others. But that comes with time, and that's part of discipleship not a part of salvation. Mm -hmm. Amen. I, I, several years ago, I made a video um, titled The Difference Between Must and Should. And since then, of course, I've also uh, made this same point, uh, I bet, a hundred times um, in, in videos. Um, and it, it's, it's disturbing to me uh, surprising to me that anybody could not see that uh, that it is so clearly stated that there are certain things that we must do to get saved and then there are certain things that we should do after we're saved and the words must and should are not synonymous they, they do not mean the same thing but the the lordship heretics uh, they they take their verses they're telling us what we should do and uh, saying that that's a must verse. You've got to do that uh, to get saved, to keep your salvation, or to prove that you're one of the truly saved people. Um, so you you like using the uh, distinction, the difference between a believer and a disciple, the difference between salvation and discipleship. And that's a good way of expressing it too. Uh, but yeah, I think uh, that last uh, talk we had, a, we were talking about one verse and then you pulled up two or three or four others that were making the same point. I was really impressed how you were able to uh, find all those verses that were basically saying the same thing. And here's, here's the, the same principle, as you said, telling us that we're saved by grace, but that now we should do things. So um, let me 
I'm going to read this in context. I'm three verses here. I, by the way, if you look at the uh, text uh, column on our screen here, you can see I posted that the verses there. Can you see that? Yes. Okay. All right. So uh, that'll make it easy. It says, "For the grace of God that bringeth sal salvation hath appeared to all men." Now that's the verse we're we're discussing, but of course you are very good at uh, saying, "Well, let's get some more context." Uh, the verses before and after can be very very relevant, and can really uh, totally change our understanding of what the verse is about. But in this case, I want to look at that one verse a little bit more. It says, "For the grace of God that bringeth salvation." So it's saying there that grace is what brings us salvation. And I talked in an earlier discussion. Uh, uh, I think I uh, I made a big deal about the difference between grace and mercy. And uh, so the Bible says, for by grace are we saved. And a lot of people, they, and for some reason, they don't really ponder and meditate or even get a dictionary out and try to figure out what does that mean, that word grace. <laughs> They just it either goes over their head or they just ignore it like it's 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 not so important But that is one of the most important words we find in the Bible the, the grace of God and it's um It's only because God's gracious gracious God's grace is is uh, um, The fact that we do not deserve eternal life we don't deserve this guarantee of going to heaven because if, if it was based upon our personal merit, we all fall short. Uh, the, the standard to be in heaven is perfection. And brother, I, I, I really like you and admire you as much as I know you, but I, I, I doubt very much that you're a perfect man. I know that I'm not. And, and the people who think that they are, that they don't sin anymore, and they, now they're perfect, uh, they're, the Bible says that they're deceiving themselves. The truth is not in them. So the, the word grace is, is important because we, we learn that um, only because God is gracious, not because we're deserving. Grace is when you get something wonderful that you didn't earn and don't deserve. It's only because God's gracious. And then it said, that bring us salvation and it hath appeared to all men. Now that's a very important point because you and I, are, uh, you know, um, we are, um, I, I would say, militant in our in our fighting against the heresy of Calvinism. And uh, I, I'm one of the people that believes that if someone is a Calvinist, I cannot have fellowship with them. Because, um, and, and I, I have a long playlist that's it is probably about five or ten hours long, telling all of the problems with Calvinism. But to me, it's, it's, it's a heinous, sick philosophy that makes God the guilty party. Because uh, in Calvinism, man does not have a free will. So every sin that man commits, God is making him do it like a puppet. So that means that man, God, uh, man is innocent and God is the perpetrator. Uh, so that really sickens me, and uh, anybody who believes that, I, I could not have any fellowship with them. Even if I thought that they were saved, I, I will not associate with them. But the reason I'm making a big deal about that now is because this verse here is one of the verses that you and I uh, can understand, plain English. It says, this salvation had appeared to all men. <laughs> you know, I have another playlist called Words Have Meanings. And it, when all men, uh, in other translations, they always say all people, and so that takes the gender out, but all people, uh, the salvation is, has appeared or has been made available to all people. Now, what will the Calvinists say about how they would explain that term, all men? I can't even get in their heads to really understand what they're thinking with their tulip <laughs> doctrine. Um, so I'll I'll probably defer to you. You probably you have a lot more experience on, um, you know, debunking Calvinism and and what they how they try to justify their teaching in, you know, in 
Lou, of these verses right here that are so obvious to, to us. Um, so I'll let you talk to that. But before you mention that, I also want to point out that this is a great verse to point to when somebody will say that there's many paths to salvation and say, well, what about those who haven't heard of Jesus? And, you know, maybe uh, another religion is their way to heaven. And you can show them this verse uh, as well as John 1, 9, which I just quoted about Jesus being the light unto the world. And he lighteth every man that cometh unto the world that the God's grace, God's unmerited favor through Jesus Christ, that's how he brings salvation to mankind, has appeared to all men, uh, so that all are out without excuse, as it says in Romans 1. Um, so, um, you know, that's just another um, verse to cite. And I wrote a chapter in my book, In Spirit and Truth, The Seeker's Path to Jesus Christ. One of the chapters is what about those who've never heard of Jesus? And the whole point of the chapter is God has manifest himself um, so that all people not only have knowledge of the truth, but understand it. Um, it's just up to that person at some point in their life to acknowledge the truth, to accept um, God's grace, his unmerited favor, um, his mercy, his love through the person of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I think that the, uh, I don't want to get too sidetracked and turn this uh, in, into the subject of Calvinism, but whenever I see a verse that Calvinists either use to support their position or that we use to refute it, I think I, I'm obligated to at least explain it. So um, this is a, refutes Calvinism because Calvinism teaches that uh, salvation is not available to all men, only a select few called the elect, uh, a little portion of humanity that God uh, chooses to save uh, uh, without any free will decision on man's part. Uh, and so, uh, but they, so it's the, the idea, they have basically six points of Calvinism. Uh, people think there's five, but there's actually six. Uh, but this one is called limited atonement. In other words, that uh, Jesus didn't die for all humanity. He only died for that small number of people who are the elect. And, but this says all men or all people. Um, so how do they handle that? Well, they can't handle it unless they take a word that is obvious to a 10-year-old, a, a maybe even a 6-year-old. If you ask a 6-year-old, what does the word all mean? They, they know what it means. But the Calvinist doesn't know what all means. They would say that means all kinds of men, not just uh, people in Israel, but people in Africa, people in America, you know, all kinds of men, uh, Jews and Gentiles. It doesn't say all kinds of men. It says all men. But they have to redefine things to make it. What they do is instead of using um, exegesis, which is the principle of reading the scriptures and believing what it says, taking the truth out of the scriptures and accepting it. They use eisegesis. They take their philosophy that is heinous and, and sickening in every way, and they try to force it into the scriptures, and when it won't fit, they have to redefine uh, simple words like all. Uh, okay, now that's enough said on that, but I, let's go to the next verse. Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Uh, so that's the point that you are making that is so important that, uh, look, um, um, I, I, I watched uh, a lot of um, Renee Rowland's uh, videos uh, and it seems like she's on a constant battle defending herself from the attacks that, that she's preaching that people uh, should, should not repent of sin, should not try to change their lives, should not try to live, uh, you know, holy lives. Uh, and, and I've been accused of that we've all, we've all been accused of that. They say we're teaching people have a license to sin and that we're antinomian. We, we say the law, get, you don't even have to even worry about following the laws um, of right and wrong. They want to insert the laws of Moses, which and that's really crazy to think that the whole world is, was never put under the laws of Moses. Uh, but so they want uh, 
they want to impose this legalism on us, and when we say no, these are not required to be saved, but we should do them. So we're we're saying you don't have to, uh, you know, um, study your Bible. You don't have to have fellowship with the believers. You don't have to be a charitable person. You don't have to love your neighbor. We don't say that. We say we should do all those things, but you don't have to do those things uh, in order to earn your salvation. You get the salvation because God is gracious enough to give it to you as a gift. Now, in verse says here, you should do them so that once a person is saved, uh, the, a new life begins in them. They're a new creature. And from that point on, until their last breath, uh, all Christians will be judged by, for their works. But they're not going to be judged to determine if they go to heaven or not. They're judged to determine the rewards that Paul talks about at the judgment seat of Christ. So uh, there's a lot of good reasons for people to uh, try to do good things and be a minister. Every Christian is called to be a minister. That just means servant. And what we're doing right here in addition to be an enjoyable conversation and having fellowship with you, brother, uh, this is a, a good work we're doing because we're trying to teach people and help people understand the Bible. This is a good work. We should be doing these things. But if we didn't do this, if we never did any good work, it doesn't change our, our, um, uh, our standing before God. Our standing before God is settled. We're deemed righteous. We're set as part as sanctified and holy in the eyes of God. But uh, the state we may be in at any given day in our life, it may be relatively good and bad, you know, depending on what's happening that day. <laughs> All right, brother, right. Any, any more on that, uh, that second verse there? Yeah, and I, I just like the distinction you make. I'm going to have to watch that playlist on must and should. You know, there's only one time in the Bible where it's asked, what serves what must I do to be saved? And at 1630, the Philippian jailer asking Paul and Barnabas, and the answer is, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. Um, you know, so that's what we must do to be saved is put our faith in Jesus Christ, what he did. Um, anything after that, again, is discipleship, stuff that we should do. Uh, but God doesn't need our righteousness for us to go to heaven. He's perfect in his righteousness. Um, our righteousness is our filthy rags when compared to his perfect righteousness. Um, we can't do anything uh, to earn our salvation. It's strictly unmerited favor. It's God's grace through faith in Jesus Christ that we are able to receive the free gift of eternal life. Mm hmm uh, now, the, the last verse uh, that you put up there, when you said, let's talk about all three of these verses, uh, it's, uh, it's also a very important verse, too. Um, in looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, I don't know if I should even tell you my problem with the verse. Uh, because it's, it's one of the best verses in the Bible. Um, you know, we talked a lot about Bible translations, and we talked about uh, the KJV. You and I agree, this inspired word of God, and we use this KJV uh, as uh, the test of what's true. And as for me, I, I, I don't mind looking at other translations. Sometimes it's helpful to, to see it uh, written in different ways. Uh, but... I, I compare all of those to the KJV. So this is certainly true. I'm not questioning the, uh, the truth of it. Uh, the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, uh, if we were to look at that in another translation, some of the modern translations, they phrase it, of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, to me, just because a modern translation phrases in a way that I happen to prefer, because I think it glorifies Jesus even more, doesn't mean that okay, that's the that's the uh, that is the the, the uh, inspired scripture, not the KJV. It's just that I think that this is an example of a verse where uh, a person could easily interpret as saying, you see, Jesus is not God. This is drawing a distinction. It says, the glorious appearing of the great God, number one, 
and our Savior, Jesus Christ. So some people could say, see, Jesus is our Savior, but he's not the great God. Uh, whereas if we phrase it of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, no one's going to think that you're talking about two separate people or entities. You're, you're, you're saying Jesus is our God and Savior. And I don't know if you've noticed it, but my uh, closing phrase on every video I make is uh, bless you in the name of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, because I believe, believing that Jesus is God and Savior is, a, 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 is essential in our understanding of who he is. And, and the Bible says that there's only one God. The Bible says there's only one Savior. The Bible says only God is the Savior. And the Bible says Jesus is the Savior. So when we put it together, we, we have to conclude that there's one God, uh, and Jesus is the God, is God and Savior. Uh, so we, we know that Jesus is God Almighty and Savior. In fact, the Bible, uh, if Jesus was not God, he could not be the Savior because the Bible says only God is the Savior. So he has to be God in order to be the Savior. Um, and he also has to be man. This was an argument in the uh, second and third century, by the way, uh, when they wrote all the Christian early creeds arguing about how to define all these things the, uh, in, the, in the Godhead. Uh, the word Trinity didn't exist yet, so they're trying to explain um, one God and yet Father, Son, and Holy Spirit all equally God. And uh, one of the points that what people were making is that, yeah, Jesus, they, they finally are, are saying, you got to understand, Jesus is God, fully God, equal to the Father, and God, Godness, and yet he's not man because he, he can't be man because all physical world, all matter is evil. So he couldn't possibly be man. So that was another debate. And uh, the, the conclusion, of course, was he has to be man because only man could die and uh, he had to die in order to pay for our sins. So the idea that Jesus is God and man is, uh, is an essential to, to make it all uh, really work out right. Uh, but maybe i'm going on too much of this i don't know if you've ever thought about it and I, I never noticed the distinction in this verse in the different translations because i know you're kj the only so i don't know if you've looked at this verse in other translations yeah i have and um and i've seen that distinction that it may be more clear um i look at it as just you know this this tells me that jesus christ is is being described uh, with the adjectives, great God and savior, our savior, you know, so I think this is, you know, obviously Jesus Christ is the great God. He is our savior. Um, and I don't see how this, um, you know, in context with other many verses could be used against Jesus Christ being, um, fully God. And, you know, I mean, Jesus got God, gave us um, an everlasting covenant. He gave mankind an everlasting covenant and God can never break his promise. And fallible men, we always break our promise. We can never live up to uh, the glory of God. So God knew that. And so he not only kept his part of the covenant, but he kept man's part too in the person of Jesus Christ. And so that's why it's so important in placing our faith in Jesus Christ so we can become part of that everlasting covenant with God um, through the person of Jesus Christ, um, who is fully God and fully man. Um, God kept his part of the covenant and he kept man's part through the person of Jesus Christ. And we must be in Christ to receive his promises of that everlasting covenant. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I have uh, made a lot of videos and I have a lot of playlists where I've gone to great, great pain and, and great effort to uh, teach um, who Jesus is. One of the playlists is the identity of Jesus, and the other playlist is uh, the deity of Christ proven. And so there's all together, I I'm, I'm bet there's 30 hours uh, of teaching on this point and the importance of uh, understanding exactly who Jesus is. <clears throat> so um, I, I'm only bringing that up is because, you know, I've, 
I, I've just about heard everything. People want to argue about everything. And I've heard people argue that, see, this verse is saying that he, there's, uh, Jesus is just Savior. He's not God. So I wanted to say, look, there's hundreds of verses that we, we can use to prove that, that Jesus is eternal God Almighty. God manifest in the flesh as the Son of God. So um, let that be settled. Uh, anything else on that before we go to the next verse? Yeah, let's do it. Okay, the next verse I posted in the comments section. It's Ephesians 4.32, and it says, And be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. So this is Paul writing to the church of Ephesus, to the church of Ephesus, and you know I think what why this verse is in this uh, list of 101 uh, verses on faith alone is for Christ's sake. Um, that's the reason that we are forgiven. You know wh what sake mean? Uh, you know for for Christ's purpose, for His end goal, uh, for God's end goal and purpose um, is for. Our forgiveness and you know we see right above that again going back to verse 30 um, we're sealed by the Spirit of God by the Holy Spirit unto the day of redemption and that reminds us of the verses the passage that uh, we discussed a few videos ago in Ephesians 1 verses 12 through 14 um, that we're sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise into the day of redemption um, same as that thing right here uh, through faith through our trust our belief in Jesus Christ once we place that we're spiritually reborn uh, once we place our faith in Jesus Christ we're spiritually reborn it's our spiritual birthday um, we are baptized by the Spirit into the body of Christ um, we've repented from unbelief or whatever we uh, were trusting in and put our trust in Jesus Christ um, you know that's the ceiling of the Holy Spirit and it says into the day of redemption you know when our body will be redeemed we are God's purchased possession um, you know like I said in previous videos the uh, purchased possession can't unpurchase itself from the purchaser um, you know we didn't purchase eternal life God purchased us for eternal life through his son uh, and we receive that through faith in Jesus Christ and that's how our sins are forgiven, as it says um, in Ephesians 4.32. Hmm. Well, I noticed that we've got four view people viewing this uh, live uh, talk we're having. And um, there's a, a private chat room that we, you and I have for our comments. Uh, I, I'm, but the world cannot see these. Where I'm just posting these verses for, for us to both see. Uh, but there's also another chat go that's going on on YouTube. But I, unfortunately, I don't know how to do this and access that at the same time. There is a way. Maybe someone, Matthias, showed me how to do that last week, but I don't remember how to do it. Because I'd like to see if anybody is uh, making comments or asking any questions, but I, I just don't know how to access it. Um, maybe, um, brother, if you have the ability to multitask, you could... Um, go to my YouTube channel. See, when I look at my YouTube channel, it, 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 I'm looking at it as the owner of the channel. But if you're looking at it, you're looking at it as a, uh, a, a viewer. So I think you'll see it actually going on live. But if um, hopefully in the future, I'll figure out how to do that. So if anybody is posting any uh, thing in the chat room that would be relevant to the conversation, I'd like to be able to um, you know uh, interact with them. Um, all right, so let me get back to this verse here. Um, here it's another exhortation. Um, exhort means to urge on. Uh, Paul is urging the church at uh, Ephesus. Are you sure it's Ephesus? It's not Ephesia? <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, he's urging those believers in that church to be kind to each other tender-hearted and forgive each other. Now, um, he, he's not making their salvation hinge upon how well they're able to treat each other and how forgiving they are of each other. Uh, that's important to, to note. 
because some people will say, you know, try to make this a condition for salvation, but it's not. It's a, it's a, like the same, the, the previous verse. This is something we should be doing. We're urged by Paul and the scriptures to to do these things, to to be good people as best we can, led by the Holy Spirit. Uh, uh, but uh, that's not a uh, criteria for salvation. Uh, but the important thing in this verse relevant to this topic we're on it says, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. Now, the word hath means has. It's past tense. So it says that God has forgiven us. Now, when it says you, Paul is talking to the believers in this church. The church is made up of believers who are saved. And uh, he's saying that God has forgiven you to the, to the believers. So, and it's done, it's past tense. They are forgiven, they, it has been done. So I think that's how that is relevant to the, the topic of verses that prove uh, faith alone. Uh, because once we put our faith in Jesus, uh, you know, we have been forgiven completely. And some people would argue, well, that's just for the sins up before your salvation. But once you, all your sins in your life and, until the day you believe, those are forgiven, but once you believe, there's a new uh, list, and all the sins that you commit after that, those are not forgiven, so you better stop sinning. But so they're saying past past sins are forgiven, but not your future sins. What they don't understand is that uh, the Bible tells us God forgave uh, these sins, and at that time when this was written, all of your sins and my sins and, and today's lordship heretics all of our sins were future sins. Um, so, and I, here's another distinction. I'd like for your, to get your opinion on this. Another thing I say, I'm going to say that some people are, when I say, there Brother Luke goes again. You know, how, how can he say such things? I have a position, and I don't know, uh, I know that there's actually a division in the church over this. I have a video titled, um, a universal reconciliation, but not universal salvation. And, and so the point I'm making in that is that when the Bible tells us that uh, Jesus is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world, that's telling me that uh, propitiation means the sins are paid in full. The, the debt is paid. It's, it's satisfied. Their, their sins are no longer a problem. And, but it says and not just for us only who are the believers, but for the sins of the whole world. Uh, so I believe that the sins of the whole world are paid for. Uh, other people believe that, well, your sins are not paid for until the day you believe, and then, then, and then that kicks into effect. But I believe even the atheists and the Satanists today, their sins are forgiven, but they haven't received the gift of eternal life. So here they are reconciled with God. God's already paid for all their sins, but they're not going to go to heaven and have eternal life because they won't put their faith in Jesus and receive the gift of life. That's how I see it. But uh, I know that there's a, there's a good portion of people that would, would say, no, Luke, you're wrong. Nobody's forgiven until the day they believe. Um, but that means, that gets is relevant to what we're talking about here when it says your sins, they have forgiven you. Um, all right, well, you have any opinion on that? You, you must have thought of that. Yeah, and it reminds me of um, Hebrews 10, where you know, it talks about Jesus Christ and his offering of his body um, in verse 10, by the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And then goes to verse 12, but this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God, Going into verse 14, for by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. So, you know, his sacrifice is for all sins, past, present, and future. And it's a once and for all. Um, there's no other sacrifice necessary. Um, and, you know, the, it, it, what you're saying is very biblical. It, it's just like John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So God loves the world. He loves all men. Um, but in order to receive that love, 
you know, we have to place our faith in Jesus Christ. That's the means of receiving God's love, his mercy, his grace unto eternal life, you know, to receive the free gift. Uh, in the in the same sense as you mentioned about the propitiation of sins, um, and not for ours only, but sins for the whole world. Um, you know, God reconciles the world, but in order to be part of that reconciliation, we have to be in the body of Christ, and that's through faith in Christ. Okay, uh, for me, uh, I don't really care if someone agrees with me or they think no. Uh, Everybody can be forgiven. That's uh, uh, salvation is available to everyone. So that 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 they're saying no Calvinism's wrong. Salvation is offered to everyone. So that's good. But the sins are not actually paid for until the day someone actually believes. If that's what someone believes, that's fine with me. I don't care. You know, I just I just see it differently. But it's not something that I'm going to say. Well, that's 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 such a serious disagreement. I I'm sorry. Uh, get out of my life. <laughs> uh, okay, uh, ready for the next verse? Yep. Okay. The next one, Ephesians, oops, 2, verses 4 and 5. This is a little bit cumbersome going through it like this. Cool. B. Okay. Um, let me paste it into the comment section here. Cool. Let's see. Okay, Ephesians 2, verse 4 and 5. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace ye are saved. And for some reason that's in parentheses. I, I don't know. Does that is, is that in parentheses in your in your Bible? It is. Okay. Yeah. And so, you know, we see grace and mercy in the same passage and we talked about that a little bit um you know um they're same concepts but different in the same you know in the same breath where grace is unmerited favor sort of getting uh what you don't deserve mercy is not getting what you do deserve and um god is rich in not giving us what we deserve uh, because it is great love uh, for us. And, you know, just going back again to John 3, 16. Um, but when we were dead in sins, you know, and there's a lot of people that are walking around alive in the flesh, but dead in the spirit, you know, that have not been quickened um, through faith in Jesus Christ. Um, that's what um, God is patient and long suffering for for us to acknowledge the truth uh, of Jesus Christ um, and accept um, his son for our sins um, so that we can receive this unmerited favor. That's how we're saved. Um, and so at the end, you know, we see that we are made, we're dead in sins, but we're made alive or quickened. Um, and that is with Christ. We must be in Christ or uh, with Christ, you know, being an heir with Christ or joint heir uh, with Christ. Then we are in the body of Christ. We're able to call the Father Abba. You know, he's truly our Father, our Heavenly Father um, at that moment in time. And, you know, just in case you don't get the point in verses four and five of Ephesians 2, um, this is reinforced again in Ephesians 8 and 9, for by grace are you saved through faith. But then it goes on, and that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Uh, so it's the same concept here uh, at the end of verse 5. By grace you are saved. Uh, then it elaborates a little bit more in verse 8 
for, for by grace are you saved through faith uh, and discusses it being a gift of God. Um, but in Jesus Christ, always through Jesus Christ, um, that's how he raises us up together and, and makes us sit together in heavenly places. It's in Christ Jesus, as it says in verse six. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The uh, idea that God is sovereign. Hmm. I'm getting a feedback there right now. Let me see. I think if that happens, you've got to just mute your microphone. But it's, I'm not getting it right now. But at the very top there, you have your icons there, the microphone. You can click on that and mute your microphone temporarily. Or I, I can access and, and mute it for you. Uh, but that's all right. It's not happening right now. Uh, so, again, mercy. Uh, how is God merciful? Well, uh, we, we just... We're, our normal default fate is the second death. Uh, every person uh, is is destined to to die the second death, and, and that's what we get need to get saved from. And that's that God is merciful and that He provided a way of being saved from the second death. And then the, the grace is. Wow, uh, have you ever had a moment of bliss in your life, brother? I mean, th think of the moment in your life where you can say, I, I am so happy. Maybe it was one second or 10 seconds or a minute, and you just, you're just the happiest point where you're just bubbling over with you're so happy. It's just like you're bliss. And I've, I've had moments like that, but uh, I, I think what we have, I have a series called 50 Hours in Heaven, where it's a, a playlist where we do 50 hours teaching on heaven, what we can expect heaven to be like. And um, the idea is that we'll be in constant bliss. Uh, the, the happiest moment you've ever had is just is a constant state. And it's our happiest, best moment now is, is diluted compared to the bliss I expect. And so this is how gracious God is. God has that for us, available to us. All we've got to do is uh, receive this gift from Jesus by believing in him. Um, the, uh, that, that's how much God loves us, for his great love wherewith he loved us. Now, verse 5, eight, I, I, I've always liked this verse because uh, I, I love to talk about the new birth. It says, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ by grace ye are saved, uh, so uh, we were dead in sins. Now, a Calvinist again would take a verse saying, see, you're dead. You're a dead person. You can't believe a dead person is not capable of knowing right and wrong. A dead person is not even capable of making any decisions. A dead person is, is just dead. And uh, I say, well... <laughs> You don't understand what this word death is talking about. It's, uh, it's talking about our spiritual death that happened in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve and then has been passed down genetically to all of us where we all have this dead spirit. And that's what this is talking about here, saying that, um, Brother Jason, uh, you're, you were dead in your sins. You were, had a dead spirit because of the sin problem that's been passed down through our uh, a history of mankind, but it says it hath quickened us. Quickened means to uh, bring to life. Uh, so even though you were dead spiritually, you, your spirit was dead. I, I like it compared to this. Like here's the spirit of Adam and Eve and, and God when he breathed into them and they were like God's spirit and their spirit. They're like connected. God is in them. They sinned and the spirit departed and they're left with a stub, a spirit that's dead, not connected to God. Uh, they still have a functioning mind or soul. They still have a functioning body that's, that's gradually dying, uh, but the spirit is dead. But when we put our faith in Jesus, the Holy Spirit comes into us, the Bible says, and quickens us. I think the connection to the God, the Holy Spirit, uh, and we're baptized with the Holy Spirit. That means our spirit's brought to life. Uh, we're indwelled with the Spirit. That means the Spirit is in us permanently. 
and it says we're sealed. That means the Spirit will never leave us or forsake us. Uh, nothing can separate us from the love of God. So this is, uh, this to me is uh, the, the verse that we can see. Uh, that is really, it's only one verse, but that's how much, that's what I get out of it. It's talking about our original dead state of uh, our spirit being brought to life with the new birth that Jesus was teaching Nicodemus about. What do you think of that? I think that's good. And, you know, as believers in Christ, we we need to be gracious just like God has been gracious to us and realize that those who are dead in their sins now, we were once the walking dead like they are, uh, you know, who haven't believed in Jesus Christ. And, um, you know, we've come by the grace of God to the acknowledgement of the truth and, you know, made that um, decision that, you know, recognized our, our um, that we were dead in our sins and, and we couldn't do anything about it. We needed a savior and um, seek God, you know, and believe that he is and he's rewarded of them that diligently seek him. And, um, you know, and then God was patient and long suffering for us, uh, towards us. And, um, you know, we came to the acknowledgement of the truth, you know, made that spiritual reconnection with God, um, received his uh, eternal life through faith in Jesus Christ. And, you know, that just makes me once once you once you know the power of God's grace and that that feeling, you know, um, you want to give that to others and you want to share that message with others. And so. We just need to be, you know, as disciples of Christ, um, to be patient with those who, um, you know, are are being captured by the wiles of the devil, and you know, show them love and patience and and kindness and long suffering, teaching them the true gospel, giving them the good news, uh, and let God's grace and His mercy do the rest, and just trust in God. Well, the way that this. Uh this program works here, and I'm doing now this live broadcast. Um, it's not like when I'm just recording a video uh, on my computer. I, I don't have a starting clock, so I don't know how long. I looked up at my clock on the wall here to see uh, roughly when we started. It was a, uh, almost an hour ago, I think. So I don't know if you know exactly when we started, but I think we're getting close to an hour. So if that's the case, uh, maybe it's time to, to uh, su summarize the study. Is would you like to do yeah. that? Yeah, perfect. Um, so just, let's see, we did, we talked a lot on Titus 2.11 and then did the two verses in the book of Ephesians. So we got through three passages tonight. Um, that's better in some nights. The first time we did this, we got through one. Uh, other times we may have gotten through four. Um, but I think this is par for the course. And um uh, I learned a lot from you. We got a lot out of this, I think. Um, you know, Titus 2.11, just to begin, uh, what we talked about, again, distinguishing um, salvation from discipleship. Uh, it's Jesus. It's God's grace through the person of Jesus Christ that brings salvation. We put our faith in what he did on the cross and him overcoming death for us through his resurrection and trust in that. That's how to receive eternal life. That's the true gospel. That is the true good news, the incredible, wonderful news. Um, and that it's not of anything that we do, because if it was, we'd mess it up. Uh, but fortunately, you know, we, through Christ, receive his perfectness, his righteousness, um, and his promises, which he can't break, and which have been present since the beginning of the world. Um, so from there we go on into Ephesians 4 um, that our sins are forgiven. You know, once you believe, it's present tense, you know, and, uh, and these, are, these are all sins, you know. Uh, he paid the sin penalty once and for all, for, for all sins forever, uh, as we referred in Hebrews 10. And then finally in Ephesians 2, uh, 4 and 5, you know, the statement of, by grace you are saved, and then that goes on into, again, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, um, which we all know so well. Um, 
that it's not a works, you know, it, it's by faith. The two don't mix, you know. Uh, if you mix the two, then it's no longer grace, as it says in Romans eleven six. Um, and the you make the cross of none effect, you know, if you try to establish your righteousness with the righteousness of Christ. Um, so excellent study um, tonight looking at um, all New Testament passages, uh, letters that Paul wrote to the church of Ephesus and uh, to Titus. And um, I'm just glad to be back um, doing these uh, videos with you. And now we have a live stream with audio and video. So hopefully the last third of this series uh, will be even amplified, enhanced, and better. Yeah. Um, well, uh, I'm very happy to have you back. Uh, I missed you quite a bit while you were gone for a couple of weeks on your vacationing, and uh, um, so happy that you're able to come back. Uh, I love. Well, I won't be vacationing anymore this year. I can tell you that. So I'll be around. Yeah. And now we, we have this technology to um, do the do our group our, our discussions here with you know you you can do not only audio but audio and video so I'm happy about that I want everybody to see your smiling face um, brother Matthias um, uh, he he has a a program uh, a YouTube channel called Talking Doctrine. And he does these live streams and, and broadcasts uh, regularly. He he has um, he does something I don't usually do. Um, I, I try to stay away from, and that is that he he takes people who uh, disagree on uh, core doctrines, uh, and uh, he'll have these talk talk it out with them. Yeah, I, I don't know. I just when I do these things, I I want to be sure that people agree on the core doctrines, then on all the minor doctrines. Uh, yeah, I, I'm happy about disagreements because I can learn other viewpoints, you know. But, but I, I don't like to deal with in these con in these uh, group discussions with uh, people that don't even believe the core doctrine. So that's just a difference in, in preference of what what we're trying to accomplish. I'm glad that people are there are some people like Matthias who have the temperament to do that kind of a program. But the reason I'm mentioning him is I like to give him credit for helping me to get this thing functioning again, and. Uh, Brother Matthias, if you're watching, I, I'll be calling you to so you can tell me how to access the uh, live chat area that uh, uh, that people may be making comments on or asking questions. So if we get that working, brother, next time maybe some of the people will watch and post comments and, and questions and we can interact with them that way. So hopefully that works out. But welcome back and uh, to the viewers, uh, bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus.